yeah, once again, um, welcome to Hyperledger Global Forum. Um, today we are covering insurance link securities and Ricardian contracts. Um, nothing too heavy, but we're just introducing the concept of basic Ricardian contracts and how they're integrated. And, and what we're trying to do is um, provide a construct of Ricardian contracts deeply integrated. Uh, she says we cannot hear you, but I can hear you. It's very stra strange. Can you oh, hear so us, Marta? Can everyone else hear us? Can anyone comment? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> we'll just go back then. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Who's going to so moderate the moderators? <laughs> Okay, go ahead. No worries. Uh, no worries, Martha. Cheers. Okay. Um, going back to the conversations, yes. So we're talking about how we're looking at uh, modeling um, and bringing in concepts of Ricardian contracts into insurance link securities. And the basic objective is to try and create, um, bring in some of the capital markets rigor into the insurance industry. And that's what we are trying to achieve by this objective. Um, there are a lot of initiatives which are parallelly going on within the market. And, and this is more of an observational study rather than uh, a full-fledged um, development or a software product at this point in time. Um, I'd like to first introduce Vipin Bharatan. Bert, Vipin? Yes, uh, my name is Vipin Bharatan. I've been involved in Hyperledger for over six years since its beginning, I mean, I guess. Um, and I'm the chair of the Capital Markets SIG and also of the Identity Working Group. And I'm also a lab steward. I have been working in capital markets uh, for 15 years and many other industries, uh, at, mostly as a technologist, but I got into, I got the blockchain bug uh, back in uh, 2014, I guess. Uh, now it's uh, been uh, a full-blown uh, infection. Uh, so, uh, but the main thrust of our, our talk is going to be about uh, securitization itself uh, and how everything flows from there. So, Kirti, please introduce yourself and, uh, uh, you know, keep going and I will... Um, I will uh, come in when you invite me to. Thank you. Thanks, Wilfin. Um, I'm Kirti, uh, and I'm a blockchain solutions architect by profession, um, doubling into data science and, and uh, operations research. Um, I've always worked in capital markets and financial services, especially in Lloyd's Market in London. Um, now I'm focused on two specific areas. One is looking at liquidity within the insurance uh, linked securities. I've been working very closely to Whippin as a part of the Hyperledger Capital Market Special Interest Group. And, and one of the areas that we're pursuing as a part of this group is to look at uh, some of the basic fundamental problems of better liquidity in the market for insurance linked securities. Um, I'm also doing like a joint research paper with uh, Balancer on uh, trying to look at how regulated liquidity pools could possibly solve um, some of the challenges that we have today in the uh, insurance capital side of things and securitization aspects as well. So that's that's my brief introduction today. Um, here, here is a quick agenda, a review of the agenda. Um, what we're going to talk about is a brief introduction to insurance link securities, challenges, what is a Ricardian contract, how we're looking at automation within this space, what are the avenues for um, reporting, verification, measurements, and some of the emerging opportunities for um, the risk transfer um, segue. Um, the first slide, uh, what are insurance linked securities? So these are financial instruments. Um, they're sold to investors, um, uh, sophisticated investors, so mostly institutional customers. And it's um, for the investor, well, some of the benefits are to look at it as having no correlation to capital markets whatsoever. It's all respect to an insurance risk. Um, but for the insurer or, or the insurance firms, it means transferring risk from the insurance book 
into capital markets. Now, there are certain conditions or certain um, points in, in the um, insurance uh, value uh, stream when they choose specific ILS products, but we'll, we'll touch upon that as and when we um, get into the details. But what is this? This is nothing but a simple journey which shows um, how risk is onboarded by an insurance company and passed on to capital markets. So from the left, you can look at um, the sponsor, which is nothing but an insurance company. They use a contract structure, which is a risk contract, to transfer a part of their risk book to a reinsurer. And a reinsurer is, is passing that down. So you can see that highlighted by these blue um, flags. And these blue flags indicate any contract structure that exists within the um, value chain. Um, what we simply want to talk about is the basic contracts that exist in this process. There are other multiple contracts that exist, but these are the dominant contracts that exist between most of the players. So there is a reinsurer, and now the risk is further seeded um, upstream to an insurance special purpose vehicle. Um, insurance special purpose vehicle is nothing but uh, an entity, a legal entity, which um, basically transforms the risk into um, a financial instrument of some sort. Uh, it could be a bond, it could be a fund, so it could be packaged as a fund. And that's where the whole stream of capital is, is moved in from the capital markets um, and they are rewarded for the risk that they're taking on through what is known as a, a coupon or an instrument. And um, this is paid as per the prospectus or the understanding between both the um, vendors. Now, um, there's also an important element to the insurance special purpose vehicle within the whole segue. Um, the insurance special purpose vehicle has what is known as a collateral trust. And um, the collateral trust is where most of the proceedings are uh, safely stored, like capital is ring fenced, and it's actively invested in, I would say, highly liquid um, financial instruments that generate some sort of an income. So. It creates, um, I would say, um, levels of credit risk protection, both for the insurer and for um, the uh, reinsurer and, and, and the sponsor. So moving from here, what is what are some of the benefits of this financial instrument? Why do we need to look at it? What does it provide? Um, it's for the issuer. That is for the insurance company, it provides like a direct access to capital markets, an alter alternative source of capital, a better risk mitigation, um, less exposure, I guess, uh, to count, you know, some of the credit default risk that exists. And um, sometimes the fronting partners have a longer duration. So that means there's capital available for a longer duration. For the investors, of course, the return is, is, risk covers to a specific extent. Um, and of course, uh, it has no correlation to the, the classic capital markets. Um, and there's a very clear defined maximum loss. And of course, people know what they're getting into and it's a great way to diversify uh, your um, investment portfolio. Of course, there's a tax element to it, which is clearly provided by these uh, financial instruments to sophisticated investors. Um, some of the challenges that exist today within the space, and they're really important when it comes to um, the uh, Ricardian element. So why we're we looking at the Ricardian contract element of it is, is some of these basic challenges um, are raised within the industry. And what we are trying to do is we are trying to break these boundaries down to provide better capital efficiency in the market. And our objective is to solve some of these um, issues that exists both for the sponsor as well as for the investor. So being able to do that would give us um, not only a great uh, win in form of capital efficiency, it would also give quicker capital movement from uh, capital markets to the insurer. So what are we looking at over here? So we're looking at better diversification. So now most of the insurer ILS market is, is um, 
is is taken up by cap bonds. This is like a you know eighty to ninety percent is is in cap bonds, and and there is limited ap appetite to use ILS for any other aspects of uh, risk transfer. So it's it's interesting to see why. Um, there's also a huge amount. What of are cap bonds? Oh, catastrophic bonds. Yes, um, <laughs> these are financial instruments <laughs> which are used to um, transfer the risk. So this is one method of securitization um, in which the risk is securitized uh, as a bond and this bond is then sold to end investors. And these are generally triggered by climatic part, uh, anything which has got to do with climate risk or climate exposure to any type of assets, uh, mostly into property. Uh, so that, that is one um, class of business which is predominantly in focus here. Um, some of the other challenges is high brokerage cost, um, cost of routing through many brokers and intermediaries. That's one of the challenges of doing this. Um, and some brokers or intermediaries do not understand the niche underwriting element of um, you know, the risk. So it becomes difficult for them to secure capital through ILS um, and finding a fronting partner uh, for unrated capital. So sometimes because of the nature of the risk in, in itself means even some sophisticated partners find it difficult to interpret the, the extent of exposure and, 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 and the, uh, the possibility of something going wrong. Now, um, for the investor, I think that the interesting bit is to look at uh, better transparency. So when you're investing into something, you'd always want to know the characteristics and, and, uh, of the investment and and what is uh, important for the investor, um, flexibility. So it's like um, uh, looking at a better range. Uh, so that's the basic requirement. So possibly looking at an index or a fund of funds uh, that, that, could, that could unlock some of the potential by using Ricardian contracts. Of course, management fees. Um, management fees is an important purview because um, currently the cost is too high. Uh, most of this has manual elements to it. And there's barely any straight through processing in these uh, instruments. Most of that is manually done. And most of this has handled as an OTC, uh, over the counter aspect of trading. Uh, and trap collateral in the sense, once um, the investor has invested money uh, into a specific instrument, there is liquidity, but the liquidity is in the terms of the issuer and it becomes a little difficult for the investor to get in and out of a specific financial instrument. And these are some of the basic challenges that exist today, which I, I strongly believe that recording contracts would help us solve some of these problems um, inherently by design rather than anything else. This is where I'd like to invite Whipin to share his perspective of various layers and, and, and the simplification using Ricardian contracts. Whipin? Yeah, uh, before we go further, I have to say that uh, the story of ILS is very similar to the way securitization is done in other uh, fields, uh, specifically any uh, debt-based uh, securitization like credit cards, uh, like mortgage-backed securities, which obviously was prominently in the picture 10 years ago for or 15. Now it's getting on 12, 13 years ago um, for uh, cratering the market and causing lots of problems. And most of this have to do with uh, uh, improper assessment of risk. Um, but recurring contracts, uh, the concept was originated by Ian Gregg, uh, so the basic elements of that would apply to any uh, sort of um, securitization or even issuance. So basically, uh, the idea is to create through the stack, which uh, based on technology at the bottom, cryptography, software engineering, rights, uh, uh, and then rights is uh, uh, in identity uh, you know and and the linkage 
to the rights in a contract. And then it goes to accounting, which is basically payments uh, or uh, obligations, then uh, the contract evolves into governance value. And then finally, the finance, as finance uh, um, aspects uh, are emergent through all the, the, the layers of the stack make it possible for the financial aspect of the uh, Ricardian contract. If you go to the next slide, uh, so what is a Ricardian contract? Is a software pattern which is as a single document, which means that all everything about the contract it, it's it's uh, created by the issuer and is meant to be a contract between the issuer and the uh, investor. It's a single document. That means there are no other uh, places you should go to. It is a four corner, corners of a page, like in a legal sense. Uh, it is both human readable uh, and machine possible because it is markup driven. So this is the basic uh, innovation in a Ricardian contract and which is now familiar to all of us through the various ways in which it has been implemented using smart contracts inside blockchain driven structures. But you do not need a blockchain to do this because like uh, the uh, ideas that were created by Scott uh, uh, Stornetta, which is uh, quoted by Satoshi Nakamoto, basically trying to create a global witness using a immutable commitment hashing and signatures of a document, a contract, is the primary foundation. And then, of course, uh, Satoshi's um, innovation was to make this into a global witness using uh, proof of work. That is a major innovation in uh, Bitcoin, which has taken the world by storm. And if you see that the, uh, the hash creates a contract that cannot be changed, and the other aspect of the uh, contract is that the Ricardian PKI delivers clarity. That means uh, in that same document, you, the public key of the issuer and the signing key are in the contract. And it is through uh, relationships that you know that the issuer's public key is proper, not through some CA or something else, the, the certificate, excuse me, uh, yeah. And the presumption of possession, that is the user has the contract, which is one of the challenges that Kirti was talking about, which is transparency. Does the investor know the details of the contract? That means if I have the hash of the contract and the contract itself, I know the full contract. So it's easy to share the contract with, and it cannot be altered once it has been created because of the hash and the signature of the issuer that accompanies it. Uh, and of course, the promises made there uh, result in payments in accounting. Uh, next slide. So there, there it is, which is basically the bow tie model, as it is called, the um, contract, which is a hu human uh, readable contract and is legal. The word of law uh, has, a, in this case, a PGP signature, which is obviously dates the document. Um, and also a hash is created of that um, document, and it is immutably linked to that signature 
And that becomes the founding or the genesis document for a whole stream of accounting payments that result from it. And this is the idea also in CDM, that is common domain model. You can say that it's an expression of a Ricardian contract. Uh, now, Kirti, you, you're going to finish up by linking these ideas to the challenges of ILS and how your solution solves those problems. If we have a, a Q&A uh, questions, we will answer it uh, in, in the end. Thank you. And Kirti, please uh, continue. Thanks, Wipin. Um, so Wipin kind of gave us the, the fundamental workings of how the bow time model works. And, and we take it away from here to see how we can apply some of these basic fundamentals into um, um, the, um, the actual practical use in, in operations, um, that is in investment operations perhaps. So now um, what we talk about here is the concept of several layers and, and data structures that could possibly exist. And, and some of these um, are derived by uh, the solutions that we are currently researching. And, and what we feel is um, segregation of data, which is the core data versus, uh, which is structured data versus unstructured data, um, creating what is known as um, an integrity and a data structure and on top of that. So this is like color coded in these specific layers and it talks about how we are taking some of the best practices which are already available within the industry to integrate it upwards into um, a usable format to um, ease um, automation within the um, insur investment operations or insurance operations space uh, or the ISPV space perhaps um, and, and make it a lot more relevant. Now the core data um, can be broken into financial data as well as um, contract specific data, which is legal terms. Um, and this is separated uh, within the, the core data element uh, to, to say what is structured versus what is unstructured. Um, the structured part of the contract will still hold things within the CDM format and, and follow most of the CDM. Uh, which is nothing but a common domain model which has been specified by International Swaps and Derivatives Association. Um, and what we do over here is to look at two things. One is the core data constantly has what is known as the integrity and the data structure check, uh, something like a Linux operating system. So every time the contract is loaded, it checks it for integrity. And, and this, this layer on top of that is integrated into what is known as a logic layer. The logic layer is what connects the contract information to everything which has got to do with day-to-day -day operational elements. So think about it as um, modeling a complex system. So when you look at a complex system uh, and you look at what the structure of a financial instrument looks like today, we talk about um, replicating that into some sort of, some form of a digital twin. And what this digital twin is nothing but a set of information, which is financial information, which takes in um, signals, which could be either analog or digital. So digital is something which is triggered from within the system. Analog signals are something that can be optimally triggered from the user or sometimes even from the system, perhaps. So it's just about creating the model in such a way that it is a replicable digital twin of the whole contract in itself. And in its elemental form, represent all the contractual truth and legal enforceability of um, the, the contracts which are built on top of it. Now, the last layer on top of it is called the digitization layer uh, that we're currently looking at. And this helps you plug the interoperability. Why is this important? Is because um, data is, this makes data incredibly portable and in easy to plug in. So irrespective of blockchains and what stacks you're using, um, when data is built in a specific format, it makes it incredibly easy to port the data from one technology to, to other. So that's that's the fundamental um, approach for um, this method. Um, second, uh, it, it talks about how the model integrates with various elements. And it's again color-coded to show what integrates 
to other parts of uh, possible day-to-day -day operations and forward integration into other systems and how this can be uh, defined very clearly. So you can see that the core data could be anything. It could be a counterparty risk contract. It could be you know risk transfer contract. And it could also be a CDM. So you could also look at it in the transaction structure. Uh, you can look at it as uh, between two specific entities, or you can look at it as completely as a financial instrument. But the data structure remains the same. And of course, there's forward integration into every element. So you're able to do cash and transaction management by linking um, basic information which is available um, in the Ricardian contract structure and do computations on top of it. You can do asset performance. Uh, you can also do capital ring fencing and do solvency reporting if, if that is what is required and, and that is uh, built into the structure. Analytics, of course, that is the best bet. And incredible portability of taking in signals. When I spoke about signals earlier, I spoke about both analog and digital. Maybe in the future state, we could look at oracles, which give direct you know, information into a risk transfer contract, uh, which sits within an ISPB which could trigger when required. If, if there was a flood somewhere in, in some geo location, it would directly trigger and it would create the, be the computation required to pay out uh, whatever the claim is directly or settle it or liquidate parts of the collateral which are required to pay out to the, uh, the insured. So that, that is a basic elemental structure of it. And we think that some of the um, possible benefits of doing um, implementing the Ricardian structure uh, into our contracts is you know better audit trail reporting of course that is a great benefit and I think straight through processing is is one of the biggest uh, uh, boons and I that, that cuts down the time so it may cut down the time of um, transfers it, you it might want to wrap it up uh... yeah yeah absolutely. Um, reduction, of course, in, in errors, and um, last but not the least, the most important bit is um, expense ratio reduction because of lower manual intervention. So that brings us uh, to the last part, which is compliance by design, because at any given point in time, you know if you're solvent at all. So um, that is the whole bit about uh, Ricardian contracts and how it mitigates some of the challenges we had um, shared earlier within uh, the slides. And I hope that was useful for today. Whipin, any, any closing comments? Yeah, just yeah. that uh, we have the references uh, at the end. And thank you for attending. And uh, most of it is uh, attributed to Ian. Yeah. And, um, Thanks. Hyperledger. Mm. Hyperledger. And thank you to Marta for moderating. Thanks, Marta.